Welcome in, everybody, to Inside the Borough. It's another week of Victory Week for FAU following the Shula Bowl. Robbie Lestella here alongside my co-host, Kevin Fielder, Mike Birdman, joined by special guest, as usual, Graham Chamberlain, representing UConn this week from Store Central, starting with Graham. Graham, how's it going? It's going great. Thanks for having me. appreciate it. Yeah, thank you for uh, taking some time to hop on. Kevin, Mike, what's going on, guys? What up? Winning just, is a uh, lot more fun than losing. Let me yeah, just say it as it is. It's feeling a lot better this week, I have to be honest. Yeah, Graham, you know, last week we were a bit depressed uh, here on the podcast. We didn't know what was going on with the state of FAU football. but uh, I, do, we, do we know, though, now, Robbie? Do we, do we know? I think, well, you know, it's trending positive. You never know, uh, but it's trending <laughs> in a positive, uh, positive way. Um, but, uh, Graham? Something. You know, yeah, I never yeah. – I was never – Never got too upset after an army loss because he just. No, nah, I mean that. Hard it, to prepare for. Yeah, you know some that game just went as bad as it could possibly go against a service academy, but luckily, uh, luckily they bounced back in a pretty big way, especially uh, especially in the run game. Um, but I won't bore you with FAU too much. You'll get to you'll get to see them on Saturday a little bit. But um, mm -hmm. so, Graham, so you're from Store Central. Um, is that? Uh, the same store central that's the on-field logo it is yep so just to give your listeners a uh, kind of a primer of what it is uh we are a a fan site that's dedicated to obviously yukon football but in addition men's basketball women's basketball um we are associated with the nil collective bleeding blue for good um so Gotcha. The, the proceeds of, of our site go to the NILs. So obviously, the more subscribers we can get, uh, more money goes uh, to the players. Um, and yeah, we have we had a very generous donor um, help out with getting the logo on the field. That's um, awesome. So you know, we're hoping that um, you know, just <clears throat> not, not everybody in the UConn fandom lives on Twitter. I think most normal people don't live on Twitter, anyways. So you know, it. it, it it's another way for people checking out games and, say, oh, you know, what store central, what is that? And then hopefully, you know, they come see what we're about and they like the product that we put out there. And in addition, you know, the, the biggest benefit to me is, you know, raising money for NIL. So. Yeah, that's, uh, I, I don't think I've ever heard of a, a journalism side of NIL before, but I think that's actually really cool. Uh, it allows, you know, you guys to be tapped in in a, in a variety of different ways and, and be a part of the school a little bit, but also, you know, have your journalism side, give your opinion to things because, you know, with NIL and everything, the the, the donors deserve to uh, to have the honest side of things. So um, that's actually really interesting here. I had I didn't know uh, all about that. So cool stuff going on uh, so far to start the season for UConn. Up and down, one and two, but they got they had two tough matchups, uh, and the second one against Duke was kept close. Uh, Graham, what's the feeling so far after three games? Um, there's I think there's still a little trepidation. Um, you know, week one against Maryland, despite missing, I think they're out like five guys on defense. Like that still wasn't the expectation of how it's going to go. I mean, I think, you know, I, I think people were like, oh, let's see if we can keep it within two touchdowns. Some people were like, UConn can win. And I was like, well, you know, let's, <laughs> uh, let's pump the yep. brakes on that one. Um, but, you know, the expectation was to be competitive and they, they simply weren't, um, you know, you come back the next week and you know beat their fcs opponent merrimack 63 17 i mean they haven't you know they, we don't take fcs wins like that for granted because they haven't you know the past couple of years with 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 jim mora they've been okay you know they beat one by i think they won both by no he won one by 25 one by 28 in the edsel years you know i mean shoot they even lost one to holy cross right <laughs> yeah. i mean so it's it's you know, they definitely I, I, people weren't expecting it, especially after yeah. the the lack of offense that they saw mm -hmm. the week before. Um, again, a lot of it was just like, you know, like Joe Fignano, the backup quarterback, had three hundred plus yards, but like a lot of it, honestly, like he's throwing a screen and UConn's backs are just faster than the FCS team. Like, yep. he had a couple of nice throws downfield, but he didn't have to do a ton of work really. Um, yeah. But so it was also nice to see, like, hey, you know, we have more ath athletes than a, an FCS team, which, again, <laughs> has not been the case, you know, for a while. So, 
Yeah. Happy to see that, you know, and then last week, so they, they get, they get Nick Evers back at quarterback. Yeah. He went out with um, a lung contusion and then they're keeping it. They're playing it safe with a head injury. He kind of got hit back of the head during Maryland. Yeah. I think they were just like, it's 30, nothing, man. We're not going to push this, not going to press this issue. Um, so he came back, you know, and he's a guy that they think just needs reps. And I think, you know, we saw that last week, you know, um, some inaccuracies, just throwing ball. He was tending to throw the ball low, um, yeah. which I guess is can be better than overthrowing, you know, and, you know, you don't, you don't get picked <laughs> off. But, you know, it was like, OK, man, like you got to they, they all can't catch the ball at their ankles, you know, no, yeah. so that was tough. But he did, you know, it it's been a real mixed bag for him in his starts, you know, like he's made some really nice throws and, and you can see the athleticism he has with his legs. It's just, he hasn't been able to put it all together yet in a complete performance. Um, so I think the hope is, okay, he got a, he had a full four quarters this past Saturday, led two really good drives coming out the second half against Duke. They took the lead. Obviously he couldn't hang on to that lead, but you saw a little bit of the potential of what he can do. So yeah. they're going to hope for more of that, on Saturday, um, which I know if I use the tough defense, and uh, so it, it's it would have been really, really nice to have him get that start against Merrimack because that mm -hmm. would have been just a lot of very valuable reps where he can just you know it's practice really, but in a live situation. And unfortunately, he didn't get that. Yeah, now you, I saw your tweet about eight quarters of play so far for for him. That's that's not a lot, especially when he's been in college for a couple of years now. Um, but you mentioned the fact that you know, like the expectations are kind of different right now for UConn football compared to what it was just a couple of years ago. Um, and and that and we we all saw it on the outside this off season with the talent that you guys brought in. And so it was kind of like they're like, okay, yeah, so UConn football has some NIL money now. Uh, there was the Big 12 rumors uh, going on there for a little bit. So it kind of seemed like UConn football's fan base, at least on Twitter, you know, was active and out there. So, you know, what kind of – what has kind of changed about UConn football overall? And, and is, is the NIL really, like, on par? And maybe not on par with basketball, but at least competing? No. <laughs> <laughs> um and that that's really only because you know to pay the players like what the star basketball players are going to get you're just you're not like that we're talking like yeah. you know that's like alabama quarterback money probably yeah. you know i don't know the, i don't know the specifics of what the players get i'd imagine it's a lot more than what the football players are are, are getting um yeah. So there, there is there is an infusion of NIL for sure, um, and that's helped get a quality, a player of quality that they haven't been able to get. Um, you know, I'm thinking about specifically like the, the receivers, Skylar Bell, TJ Sheffield. You know, those are Big Ten guys. Um, still a tough. You know, I'm sure you guys know how it is too. It's tough in G5. You know, yep. to get those good offensive linemen. They're at such a premium, right? Um, yeah, they really no, weren't able to get. They got a couple hardest position uh, to recruit in G five for sure. One yeah, 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 it's. And we've discussed that here before. It, it 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 is. If you're if you're six foot four and three hundred pounds and can run and you're fast, you're going to to Georgia. You know, or, or were, you're not going to go play for FAU or UConn. There like, were there were guys who were like mediocre tackles for bad, like really bad group of five schools. But because they're mediocre and can move to the second level with any type of ease, they're getting NIL offers from Pitt. Like, <laughs> if, if you want to talk about the the discrepancy, and we, we could do an entire episode on the discrepancy yeah. between having to pay players at each level, but at the, the group of five level, you are not getting a 330-pound offensive lineman who could move to the second level. That no. man is playing on Saturdays for the Miami freaking Hurricanes. <laughs> uh, there's just no other way around it. No, even though even the, there's even players that are – better than what we have playing backup. Yes, there are third you know, they'd, rather be, they'd rather go be backup and make some make better money as a backup or a third back like the third backup, you know. There are there are third string centers for SMU who are getting paid the equivalent of a small micro nation in the west coast of the like Indies. Like, <laughs> that's how much they're getting paid to go be a practice squad player effectively. 
It's ridiculous. Yeah. It's, it's that's, true. That's it's one hundred percent accurate. That's one hundred percent accurate. I don't know about the small Micronesia or whatever he was talking about. <laughs> that that, but, that um, might be an exaggeration, just just but, ever I mean, so slightly. But I bet you, you know, there's some players that are making as much as our entire line or more. Yeah. You know, yeah. as a third string backup in Alabama or one of those the premier Power Five schools. You know, so yeah, sure, one hundred percent. Yeah, and you know, and that's an area you know UConn had lost three offensive linemen last year. One of them was their center, went to Colorado. I don't believe he's getting any reps out there for Coach Prime right now. The other two just graduated. Um, so you know, they brought in a new center, um, Wes Hoey, who's an interesting guy. He's from Syracuse. Um, he was a center, but also a fullback for them. Um, so. I yeah, that was, that was curious. It's hard to think yeah. UConn has a type with just players who can also somehow play fullback. Uh, I'm sure we'll get to him later, but also can somehow yeah. play fullback is a very common theme with the UConn roster. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, they're gonna, you know, we'll, you got to use what you have, right? You know, you, you know, no one's no one's coming to help, so you got to figure out what you what you have. And, you know, and to your point, you know, last year that was kind of due to injuries, like they're kind of running out of running backs, and you're like, okay, well, we need a we need someone. Right, just in case. Um, so I mean, they, they brought in some some good players. You know, they lost they, they've lost a couple already. They brought in through, through the portal uh, before the season even started at defensive back, so they're already thin. And they brought in a new defensive coordinator at Brock from Mississippi State, who runs a three three five. So you have a scheme where you need a lot of defensive backs, and they are they've already lost two. That's so not ideal. Um, but yeah, you know, you, know, you, you mentioned the locations. It's it's a bowl game, mm-hmm. you know, and you know, it's, and it's not just the NIL. It's it, it's it's the investment in the program. Period. You know, they brought in, um, you know, they've really expanded the recruiting department, and you know, and they you know, Jim Mora was the head coach and the defensive coordinator, right? And now he's just the head coach, and you know, it's like, okay, you got you said you needed NIL money, and you got it, and you needed a defensive coordinator, and now you got it. Um, you know they're, they're they're getting fans out to the stadium. It's like there's only one more thing to do, right now, right? and that's that's to win ball games. Yep. Yeah. No, that's the thing is like when wins don't come right away. I mean, we saw it. You know, the fan base at FAU when when zero and two was on the docket and potentially zero and three. It was you know getting to doom or gloom time. Uh, so when those wins don't come right away, it, you know it 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 can be frustrating. Um, to the fan base, but you, you mentioned the defense a little bit. Uh, Tom Herman said you, the, the scheme comes from the Rocky Long School, uh, three three five, like you mentioned. A um, little bit of a struggle, though, in the run game to start. Um, it, you know, it didn't look like Mary Mack had a decent game. What do you think has kind of led to that? Um, and, you know, FAU just came off a big game running the ball, so they're going to be trying to run that thing, I'm assuming so. Mm-hmm. So you think this is a game where they can step up? <laughs> <laughs> Here's the thing. So they're missing arguably their best lineman in Price Yates. Um, he's dealing with concussion, head injury type thing. Um, and it sounds like it's unclear how long he's going to be out. He hasn't played yet this season. Um, so like, and, and, and it, it is a three, three, five. Um, there's, there's some flexibility in there. You know, sometimes it's just a four, two, five. Um, and they kind of play around with, you know, bringing in like the hybrid type or an edge guy kind of thing in there. Um, you know, Maryland did pretty much whatever it wanted to do, um, which was frustrating to watch. And, you know, Merrimack was, you know, looking at the box score. Um, I will be honest. That's all I did for Merrimack. Like they, I mean, they got a lot of the, in the end, I mean, yeah. and you kind of really emptied, the bench, something they, they very rarely get to do. So that was, that, you know, it's much different when you get to, you get your first play, you know, you get guys in when you're winning as opposed to losing, right? Um, and, you know, last week was disappointing too. You know, Duke had not really moved the ball on the ground much all year. And then all of a sudden they get easily their best effort of the season. So, you know, it's hard to say exactly what, what's going on there. I mean, I don't think they're getting enough of a run stuff, you know, without Yates. Um, he really commands a lot of attention. Yeah. Because he's definitely their, their premier pass rusher. Um, so I think he kind of takes the attention away from some, some of the other guys. Cause like, Oh, I'm trying to avoid this sack and that will 
free up Jelani Stafford or Dalmon Cordain, or um, they have Georgia Tech transfer Jack Barton in there, who's been good, but I think could use a little extra. They could use a little extra out of him this weekend. Um, and at linebacker, um, all pretty much new, with the exception of one returnee and Tui Fumita Brown. Mm-hmm. who's good but it's another guy that's like you know the more games he plays the more reps he gets the better he'll be you know last year he was kind of just thrown into action and like he had re- rarely played and it's like hey you're the starter now good luck buddy uh, so they have Jaden mcdonald who yeah. is he's great in the pass rush one of the best tacklers on the team also dealing with a torn labrum he's just kind of powering through. Um, there's a lot of guys with clubs on the defense right now. I think Jim Mora said there's three. We got three clubs in the defense right now. Um, Never good. So I got, uh, He's got one on the offensive line. So at least it might be even uh, in terms of the clubs. Um, but, you know, you, you mentioned uh, – uh, yeah. Robbie, Robbie, yeah. I don't uh, – sorry to interrupt. Graham, I think I'm sensing a trend as to why they're struggling stopping the run. And you can correct <laughs> me if I'm wrong. Uh, I'm someone who covers the three three five full time. full-time. Uh, I, I cover Kansas State primarily. So mm-hmm. okay. I, I've watched the three three five from start to bottom, every iteration of it. You name it, I've probably watched it. Um, start to bottom, huh? It, it, it's really starting to sound like you don't have the dudes along the defensive line to be running the three three five. Like just like to be honest, uh, it's sounding like you guys don't have the guys in the front seven to be able to effectively run the three three five against power four talent. Uh, it works probably against group of five talent. Uh, you know, most teams that UConn is playing this season are not going to be Duke and Maryland, who have better athletes than UConn, uh, and to maybe some degree FAU might have better athletes than UConn as well. But like that's going to help them when they're not playing those teams. But you can't stop the run against those teams when you just don't have the dudes up front. Like, it it is very much a very simple task of, like, do you have the dudes or not? And I don't know, from what you're saying, between the injuries, between, uh, you know, the newcomers are wrong, it just doesn't seem like they've got the dudes to be able to stop those teams. They may not. Um, And, you know, the defensive line is kind of a relative strength of, of the team, right? I mean, just because they have such veteran leadership coming back. Uh, but again, missing Yates is huge. He was really primed for like a big season, and you know he gets concussion in practice, and I guess it he he got better and it came back. And now you know when it comes back, they're like, okay, we're not gonna. That's it. Like we're so like he may be shut down for a while um, if if he comes back at all this season. Silver lining is he can't go to the NFL or declare. So you know, mm. which was which could have been a possibility because he could use his COVID year if he wants to if he wants to come on back. Um, but yeah, it, I think they're still kind of searching for the linebackers too. It's really been kind of of a, a revolving door, and they have a lot of young guys that they've recruited like out of high school and eventually those guys are going to have to develop and they're going to have to step up. Um, mm-hmm. But, you know, past couple of years. A problem, that's another problem though. If they develop a lot of the times they become, well, they go. Right. They work, they become worth something and they're gone. Right. The most successful offenses are the teams that have a group of linemen that play together for like four years, you know, and right. you never see that anymore. And I don't know if we'll ever see that again at our level. So, I don't know. It's may not. It may not. I mean, that was something pretty cool about UConn last year is the whole offensive line were developed by UConn, right? Mm. Like it was, it was a full line. You know, Christian Haynes came back for a sixth year. You know, he's with the Seahawks now. Like it was really – yeah. Like, but to your point, is that ever going to happen again? I mean, I guess – schools bump up their nil enough you might be able to retain some guys you know i think eventually it's going to kind of turn to a place where nil is used a lot for retention rather than acquiring yeah. uh, i don't know if we're there yet but and then who knows with the revenue sharing that that could all go out the window you know i don't know and i don't <laughs> proclaim to know where everything's headed um 
Yeah, no, no one. I don't think anyone knows where the world of NIL is headed. Uh, could all change tomorrow. Pete Dammel or uh, somebody could drop a tweet and the whole world flipped upside down. So won't be Waj, though. That won't be happening. No. Um, but, you know, going, you know, touching on the offense one more time, you know, you mentioned Skylar Bell. Um, and then you also have really two talented backs, both Robinson and Edwards. In this game, do you kind of see UConn trying to further the development of Evers and, and the connection he had with Bell last game, or do they try to kind of lean on the ground game a little bit more to help him feel comfortable? I would like to see them lean on the ground game more. Um, I mean, even against Maryland, like they were moving the ball on the ground at a pretty decent clip. It's just it wasn't enough to, you know, mm -hmm. uh, to, you know, the defense gave up 600 something yards. I mean, you're not going to, whatever. Uh, yeah. Nope. UConn's not going to put that up. Um, I think the best possible scenario for Evers is to just keep, complete these short passes. And it, it sounds silly, but like he, kind of struggled last game, you know, like I'm thinking about some, he's trying to hit bell bells is kind of coming in on like a screen, you know, over the middle. And I like guess at his feet. And it's like, if he can just get these balls, if he can get into good rhythm, built his confidence, you know, coach Moore said yesterday at his press conference, like he doesn't think he's, he's not confident, but there's uncertainty in mm -hmm. his game, which. I mean, That's never good. You see it with Bryce Young right now in the NFL. It cost him his job, confidence, and uncertainty. Other than that, I mean, I'm not a scout evaluator. I don't want to get into his talent, but that's what it looks like from the outside. And when it gets a quarterback, it's never good. Um, but kind of, you know, closing out here a little bit, um, what's this atmosphere at this game expected to be like? You mentioned the fans have started, you know, showing out for football. Is it is it going to be a packed house there at the rent? Packed is relative. Uh, <laughs> I did, you know, we come from FAU. Uh, that, we, know the feeling, we know the feeling. We had a packed game the other day. <laughs> you know, is that going to be – you're going to see, like, you know, I'm sure they'll show a po the pre, you know, pre game and they'll put it out on all the socials and they'll show, like, the night games back in the day, Big East days, you know, the Thursday, Friday night games on ESPN against West Virginia and stuff. It's not going to be that. Um, <laughs> but night games are pretty fun there. Yeah. Um, you know, I would expect probably maybe 25,000 or so. Um, should be a good student section. The student section is usually ha has been strong in the past couple of years, especially in the earlier months. Um, yeah, night games at Rentschler can be can be fun. And we've had a lot of good times. Not recently, but we've had some in the past. Yeah. No, it's, it's kind of been the same way at FAU. Not a lot of good times and recently, but they've been there. They've been there and they're trying to bring them back. Um, which is it's kind of sounds like FAU and UConn are both trying to accomplish similar things with their programs yeah. at the moment. Um, but last question for you, Graham. So what does UConn need to do in this football game to win? And what can't they do if they're not going to lose? They need to run the ball and they need to have Nick Evers be fine. I think, you know, he doesn't have to do anything crazy. He doesn't need to rush for 100-something yards. He doesn't need to throw for 250, 300. He just has to be accurate and consistent. And, you know, to your to the next question of what, what can they not do is, you know, they can't turn the ball over. You know, I saw FIU at five last week, right? Like you can't, you know, what FIU had the ball for, what, 38 minutes, something like that. I mean, that's – cannot do that. Definitely not strong enough defense to give their opponent the ball for 38 minutes and – expect to win so you know be safe with the ball and oh and they're, they're they experimented with some trick plays last week um at some pretty inopportune times i would say like on some third and sevens late in the game and stuff like let's not do that uh, <laughs> you know, i saw those plays don't ever yeah. do that again and i was like <laughs> i'm in our group chat for store central might like, just be normal normal wins like, yeah, so be normal and, you know, stick to your strengths. And I think it's going to be close. I think it's going to be a really close game. Um, I really think it's 50-50. Um, but yeah. for their bowl hopes and just their progress as a program overall, it would be it'd be pretty big to get a win at home. We shall see 7 p.m. from the rent in Hartford. Graham, where can the people find you on social media? 
Yeah, I'm on X, Twitter, whatever you call it, um, at, at Paws Arf Blog, at P-A-W-S-R-F Blog. Yep. Um, and you can also check us out, check us out at storecentral.com, spelled like the town Yukon is in, S-T-O-R-R-S. Um, not everything's behind a paywall, so we do have some things available. Um, if you want to check that out. Um, I think you can see our preview that you and I did, Robbie, earlier this summer. Yep. On yep, there. yep. Uh, man, things have changed since then. But <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it's there if you want to see it. Yeah, yeah, you can uh, you can put a clown face over mine uh, when I talk about uh, the potential. Uh, but anyway, Graham, thank you so much uh, for hopping on with us, uh, and I'll I'll catch you on Saturday, man. We'll see you up there. All right, sounds good, guys. Thanks All for having right. me. Yep. See you, Graham. All right. Now that he's gone, <laughs> uh, Mike can talk his uh, his trash about the opposing. Can we team. talk about winning. I love winning, guys. I don't know if you if I said this before. I love winning. And that was uh, keeping up with tradition. That was awesome. I love I love a good FIU stomping in any sport. I mean, the, the, the only question I have is: Does the trophy have to start paying rent at some point? I mean, no. this is becoming a freeloader. It, it, I, it, no, <laughs> the trophy stays for free. I I'll pay it. Lucky I'll, pay it. I'll pay it. I'll pay it. I think that FIU they they built an empty case uh, for their for their Shula Bowl trophy. Um, it will remain empty uh, for the for the meantime. Uh, so they really they really think. And um, you know, ooh, I got some big thunder here in Boca. Um, Oren, oof. Um, that's side 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 side. On, that sidelines guy on Twitter, man. That man, I'm so happy we beat them. That guy's an idiot. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I think um, I think yeah, for me in that game, it was cool. he's not even good at trash talking. He's just like, <laughs> we're going to beat you. You guys stink. I mean, you know, I think he was just trolling. Was I, don't, I don't necessarily <laughs> think he really thought that game was going to be, uh, <sighs> be competitive because, you know, I, I, I thought there was a chance. Trust me, I did. I thought that game could have been competitive in the beginning part of it. I was – Sure. Uh, those three plays, they came out three plays, boom, touchdown. I was like, oh, damn. Three Should plays, be- touchdown for them. FAU goes nine plays, 10 total yards of offense uh, yeah. in their first three drives. That's not good. Uh, that also included a punt block, but the defense at the same time, they, they they held it down for them. They When that punt was blocked, they got the ball at the 12 and they didn't give up points. Uh, I- so. It was that, awesome. yeah, then we had that interception, and I feel like that interception was like the spark that we needed. Like, the confidence. Remember we talked about confidence last time? How like I felt like FIU had a better chance this game because they had like confidence on their side. They were like confident. They're coming up here to, to win. Yeah. I feel like once we got that interception, then I think right after that we we threw a really good pass to start that drive, right? Like yes, and I, I yes. I'm trying to I'm just trying to relive live that because it was I was like watching. I was like oh oh. Oh man, this is like this is looking good right now. I think once they once they got that feeling of like a deep completion at, right after an interception and the momentum turns, I feel like the confidence kind of kind of got there for a minute, and they, they're like, "We could do this. We could play football. We could win. We're better than them. We're faster. We could catch the ball. Like let's, let's do it." And I feel like they played like that for the like literally the rest of the game. Mm. Right? I, I, I mean, that's what that's what I saw. Um, I, I I mean you know I for me it's going to be that seventy two yard run or seventy four whatever yeah it was. that was awesome too that that, awesome. that that you know showing you can run the ball uh, and it wasn't just that you know they were finally getting you know three four five yards on their runs in early down situations which was huge you know I mean you know people are just going to look at that it's three four five yard run chug it off but they weren't getting those there was nothing nothing like nothing going in those first couple games uh and they finally were able to generate first down set the offense up in manageable situations which it just made the offense look better as a whole um and and you know i i was i was pleasantly surprised run that ball uh i was i was awesome it was awesome to they see. also they also moved the pocket for cam fancher which yeah like, yes to, to some yeah, degree yeah, yeah. To some degree, you had, a few, Cam, you had a few seconds to stand up. Yeah, yeah. Like Cam Fancher has a very limited, like he's not a pocket quarterback. Everyone who's ever coached that man will tell you that that man cannot sit in the pocket for five seconds and break down a play. Like, like if you're asking, a, he sees a hole. Yeah, he takes. Yeah, off. like if you're asking him to do that, and I think to some degree in those first two weeks they were asking him to do that a little bit more than they should have. You're going to struggle because yep. like he's going to get hit. He's going to make the wrong read at times. They finally just simplified it and went, you know what? This is the offense. You're reading A, B, and then if it's not there, dude, just use your legs and let's go make a play. Yep. And, like, 
he does that. He, <laughs> I would <laughs> like it. I would like it if he tried to not take every hit in the book and look like a crash test dummy out there. But uh, yeah. when he's he averaged like four and a half yards after when, contact, when he's getting out into space, he's Fast. the most unstoppable quarterback in college football. Yeah, uh, no, you have to find ways to keep maximizing that, and they they did that. And I think part of that was, as you mentioned, Robbie, they were finally able to run the ball with some level yeah. of consistency. They weren't yeah. uh, second and twelve every play because they got stopped on first down trying to run the ball. Uh, yeah. It's really difficult to win in the American if you can't run the ball. Look at every team who's ever won in the American. They have yeah. a good running back, and they're able to stay on schedule. And uh, to to some degree, like, I, is it sustainable or not? We'll see. Uh, that's, I guess, always the biggest question when you have a really good game after two bad games is, is that just one good game or is it sustainable? Uh, if you can run the ball like that, this offense can be good. Like, that's just truthfully what it's going to take. Yeah, you know, they did. Th they they ran the ball well, like you mentioned, but they also improved the pass. Um, you know, Cam, uh, we'll, we'll get into it in a little bit, but he's, he's been dealing with a thumb injury, so that, that kind of helps me, you know, see things. Well, some of those throws that he missed at times are a little a bit like, whoa, uh, but you know, he's dealing with that injury, uh, and he's managing it. And they're finding different ways to manage that injury, uh, which I think is important. Um, but you know, overall, uh, the defense forcing five turnovers is huge. Um, and you know, you mentioned Cam running the ball. I, I, I kind of said it there. He averaged four and a half yards. It might've been like 4.3 uh, after contact, which, you know, is dangerous as a quarterback, but you know, that's, those are yards that are huge to get uh, when it looks like the quarterback is just going to, you know, lay down. He's at, he's getting those four extra yards, uh, which you don't, you know, can't, Kevin mentioned, you don't see that out of a lot of quarterbacks uh, in, in the, in the, in the American, let alone the country, just bully people like that. Is it dangerous? Maybe. Oh, he's Maybe. tough. Man. You, you can't take that away from him. He's, he's tough. He could, <laughs> He took some hits that would have leveled me, that's for sure, and probably any of us. So, Yeah, but so going into UConn, you know, we heard about the uh, the struggles of the defensive line uh, that, that that they have. To me, the game plan is to find any way possible uh, to get that run game going and lean on it. Um, but, you know, they also haven't been too consistent in the past. Um, is this a game where FAU tries to just ground and pound, or, or is, is there any world where we see FAU try to expand on maybe rolling Cam out more and, and trying more things with the pass game? I'd like to see them. I'd like to see them throw the ball a little bit more. I feel like I, I feel like they look pretty. It looked pretty good this the, the FIU game. I mean, that would be definitely more exciting version of football, right? When you throw the ball. Mm -hmm. um, you know, furthest uh, yard per attempt of all season. So he's, you know, moving. Yeah, I, think, I think if he can, I think if he could build on what he did against FIU, I think, you know, I think, I think that the, the pass game is definitely going to be there, especially against UConn who kind of struggles on defense a little bit right now. So yeah. maybe we'll be able to expose that a little bit and then they'll be, then I'll leave it open for the run. You know, also, I, I don't know, man, it, it's, I'm feeling good, but I'm a homer. So. <laughs> Uh, don't, don't yell at Birdman in the comments, folks. You know, that's just him. That's what he does. Uh, they should take whatever game plan they had for FIU, copy that, paste that 12 more times, or however many more games they play. Uh, I There is there is a lot to be like, yeah, do you want Cam Panchers going the ball? Sure, you, you did spend a lot on him. He is still your quarterback. Uh, I don't care, man. If Subaru Mobley is running for three touchdowns a game, you could throw the ball three times a game. If if we win the game fourteen no nothing, as long as we're winning, but yeah, if if, if we win the game fourteen nothing and it's the ugliest fourteen nothing we've, I will be the most excited man that Sunday. I will wake up happy. He um, has he has he has an arm. He has a tendency to overthrow a little bit, right? We we, we saw that. Yeah. And um, but man, when he's on, he's got a cannon and he throws the ball hard. And, uh, I hope I hope I hope he I hope he I hope he uses it this game. I really do. I, th I think the confidence is up. And did you guys notice something different about the uh, the coaching this this past game? Uh, not it necessarily. Was, I'm I'm in the roof, so I don't. It was from my from my vantage point, sitting uh, on my couch that is right next to me right now. You couldn't uh, see. Charlie Fry was actually on the sidelines. Charlie Fry uh, probably should have been on the sideline last season. Um, so he was on the sidelines, and I feel like the energy on the sidelines was different. You know, he was getting in the huddles and. Uh, you know, kind of talking to each player, getting in their ear in between plays and stuff. And I, I think that might have made a difference too. He didn't start the game down there. 
So then that was probably a, a yeah. halftime thing. I, I think no, that was probably... It was, it was first half. It they was, they took him down midway through the game. I had never quarter. seen a team take it down. Oh, I wish I caught him in the elevators, like just run into the elevators. I like, I can only I imagine. I, yeah, I, don't, I don't know. Like, I don't know when he got there, but he, he I, was there in the first quarter. Yeah. I, but that also feels like a necessary change because with the way that Fancher was sort of struggling at times – it's a lot easier yeah. if you – Back to the confidence thing, too. If the guy calling the plays is, is with you down there in the trenches, yeah, like, that, that might definitely it, help. You, you it's, know? it's very much a thing of, like, there are new rules where, like, you can have extra coaches on the sideline and you could move a, a wide receiver coach onto the sideline or an analyst onto the sideline and have them serve as your wide receiver coach. But, like, there is something to still having your offensive coordinator down there because if you fuck up – or, excuse me, mess up, uh, it's um, – it's like if you mess up, there is a lot easier <laughs> of a way that it uh, – like it's a lot easier if you've got the guy on the sideline who's calling the plays because then it's, hey, what'd you see? Okay, uh, I don't agree with that, but you know what? Here's like let's let's take a look and see how you, how you messed up because it's like – I don't know. It's just like it feels weird to me if it's like – and this is why I don't love it when the quarterback coach is ever in the booth. I know a lot of coaches prefer it. It feels weird to me when the quarterback coach is calling the quarterback on the phone after every drive trying to figure out why something didn't go right or why something went right. right. Uh, and I know for some coaches it's a feel thing, but I, I agree that like for confidence reasons alone, get the dude on the sideline because the energy was different. It was, yeah, it, it was yeah. better, you know. So good, good on them, good on Herman for, for if, if that was him, good on, good on him for that. If it was Charlie on his own, good, good call, dude. Yeah. Uh, that's a I didn't I did not notice that uh but that is that is yeah that is definitely uh something that could have played a major difference uh in that game cuz I, I don't know when he came down but the offense woke up at some point and they and they figured out where the holes were in the run game they were getting pushed Cam was hitting targets um but you know I mentioned uh the injury to Cam uh earlier and that was you know what Tom Herman taught we asked him about it this week he got his he got his throwing hand stepped on against Michigan State he didn't mention which exact finger um but you know his exact quote is I mean this is something that's probably going to be bothering him until the bye week and we can rest it uh completely for a good week um it's his throwing hand you know there are some throws that you see and it's like he kind of looks at me like this uh, was the motion that Tom Herman made. So are you guys concerned at all with the offense having a quarterback that is suffering from a hand injury? It, it's obvious that he is still the best option available. They wouldn't start him if he wasn't. Uh, but, you know, he's admitted that he's missed some throws because of it. So it's kind of like uh, – It's football. It's football. You, know, you can play, you play through it. Right, finger, injury, yeah. finger injuries can always be a little tricky, uh, depending on which finger it is. Uh, if it's your thumb, you can't throw, right? Like if it's if it's your thumb, you're probably not playing. Period. So it's like I mean, we seem to be fine the other day. Yeah, we can remove the thumb as you can blame, any, blame any bad throw on an injury, and people will believe. Yeah, it, right? you, you, the ball. Like, come on, like, you, you could throw a bad pass and then just go to the sideline. Go, oh, finger, coach. Oh, yeah. it's this one. It's this one. Like so, I think, I think he's fine. I think I, I don't I think it's inconsequential. I think I don't know. It's yeah. something that you You're probably just want to be playing. You don't. Yeah, know. like it's probably something you just have to deal with because it's like, yeah. if it's not going to be healthy until the bye week, which is I think the next part of that quote by Herman was like, uh, he's just going to be dealing with it, guys. Like you just kind of have to deal with it. Uh, that just means it's a nagging thing that like, uh, whether it's like a break, I don't know if it's like a break in the finger or something. Like you could play through that. You can yeah. or, or a sprain. You know, like, like it's whatever. it's football. You're going to be dinged up all year. You're going to be playing with the thumb with finger injuries all year. Uh, rehab it. Be ready for Saturdays. Uh, he doesn't need the practice the reps on Tuesday. Well, I and hope so, little, I hope his little thingy is fine and <laughs> and, he, and he throws for three four touchdowns on Saturday. That's what I'm. That's what Only I'm, three. Damn. I, I I hope he throws for eight. I hope he throws like we got like, to run a few too. And uh, have, yeah, I guess. Not going to score that much. So what if he scores eight total touchdowns and runs four in as well? I think yeah. that's a problem solved. I, problem I think solved. we figured out all the problems. Oh, yeah, my finger's fine now. <laughs> <laughs> it would be really funny. It would be really funny if he like scored seven touchdowns this week, and the first thing he tells the media is like, "Yeah, I never had a finger injury. I was just messing with y'all." Yeah, yeah. I, I say that when I overthrow the ball. <laughs> <laughs> I think that would. I mean, you know, he could say that too. He could have had a finger injury, but if he comes out here and throws five touchdowns, he could say whatever he wants. Uh, so, um, yeah. but you know, I. I 
that was re- that was one injury that was concerning to me. Dotri Richardson out uh, at right tackle potentially he broke his hand prior to uh, uh, to that FIU game. Alex Akovich subbed in there, but the F- FAU was still able to run the ball uh, with a backup right tackle in there. Uh, that didn't seem to bother them. Uh, they're going to try to get Daughtry playing this week uh, with a small uh, club. He's got a full club right now, which that's can't concerning. Play with. That's uh, concerning. If your office live, it's in a club. I'm just going to be honest. Yeah, yeah. They're going to try. They said they're going to try to get him in something where he has some fingers available to him. Uh, but at the moment, he's fully clubbed, and Atkovich, uh will be in game two. But it worked enough for them uh, against uh, against FIU. We'll see if uh, it's a problem against UConn. Uh, who they, you know, he did mention uh, they do have a pretty solid edge rusher in Jaden McDonald. Um, so we'll see if that kind of plays any type of factor at all. But they, they the week of practice at right tackle for Atkovich now. I'm assuming he's been there. Um, hopefully, there's no uh, no adjustment needed. I wanna I wanna shout out one guy in the offensive line who I went back and I watched the game uh, yeah. a couple of days later. Uh, Malcolm Lamar was insane. He was absolutely incredible. Uh, a lot of those runs that Mobley had and that Campbell had. Uh, when they were running to the left side of the field, it was because there were plays where Malcolm Lamar had the dude halfway down the sideline <laughs> looking like he never played football before. And uh, the offensive line struggled through the first two weeks of the year. There's no other way to say that. Everyone in the building knew that. Everyone who watched a game knew that. Uh, yeah. They played winning football on Saturday. And a lot of groups played winning football. Like, let's be clear, there was probably very few groups who didn't play winning football. On Saturday, you don't beat a team like that if you don't play winning football across the board. But to see an offensive line with, as you mentioned, a backup right tackle in there, uh, you know, an offensive line that faced problems because they just didn't play well through the first two games. To see Malcolm Lamar go out there and play the way he did, I thought Lamas had a pretty good game yeah. at at guard. I thought Morangus was okay. Uh, yeah. he, he had a couple of plays where it just wasn't perfect. And the center's role is far more important than just blocking. So at this point, I'm not going to like knock a dude if he's calling out every blitz protection. Cam Fancher did not get sacked a lot. No. That should be an indication that the offensive line and that the center played well. Yep. Uh, more than him blocking on a run play or whatever. Um, and I thought Akovic, for a dude who had to be put in the game uh, because of an injury pregame, that's not an easy position to be in. Uh, it's no, not an easy position to be called into being being played. He hadn't been the backup hurt. tackle for. I mean, he's a utility guy on that line, so that's where he stepped in. But he's been the backup center, backup guard, pretty much all all summer and to start this season. So that that was really uh, really good to see. I know Ed Warner was uh, running up and down the sidelines. I like Ed. Good guy. Yeah, really, that's awesome. Really good guy. Yep, yep, yep. Um, but kind of looking uh, looking at UConn a little bit, uh, you know, he mentioned Nick Evers. Uh, he mentioned uh, Fajano, the backup quarterback. Uh, we're going to be facing off against Evers. The FAU was able to cause problems for Aiden Childs. Me and Kevin debated uh, whether, you know, early before that game, whether it was going to be the blitz or the disguising of coverages. Um, I think it was a little mix of both uh, what it ended up being, like we said. was Well, they got of- home. They, the yeah. truth is, regardless of what they were doing on the back end, they were winning with four all game. Yeah. It's a lot easier to play football when you're winning with four guys like they were against Giles yeah. and then against Jenkins on, on Saturday. Uh, yeah. So what do we need to do against Nick Evers? He struggled, hasn't, hasn't had the best. He mentioned missing throws, a um, bit of a young QB issues, but what's, what's the game plan, Kev? Uh, I'm going to go with a very similar, and this is very cliche. I'm going to sound like every defensive coordinator anyone's yeah, ever talked about. That. Uh, it's boring, yeah. You got to win with four. You have to be able to win with four. Yeah. Uh, if you can get it, and I know Chisholm had a really good game. Um, I don't want to pr- pronounce his last name because I'm going to butcher it. Is it Fani? F- 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 yeah. Fani? Wow. At least that's what it looks Chisholm. like. Guy. Chisholm. It's, it's Chisholm to me. Uh, just because I don't want to butcher it every time I say it. But he was incredible on Saturday. And I, I think you heard his name called every single pass rush rep he had. Yep. Uh, Chris Jones has looked good through the first two, three weeks of the year. Uh, he was a little more quiet last week against FIU. But uh, if you can get those guys going and you can get Evers into situations where uh, you've got seven guys in the back end who can all cover, uh, you're fine. Uh, Evers is not a special enough quarterback where he can beat uh, a four-man pass rush that's getting home on every play. Uh, and so if you can keep doing that, uh, whatever you do on the back end won't matter. Now the secondary, they need to just keep being them. 
Uh, they've played incredible through three games. They've been one of the better secondaries in football. Uh, I know Day Day Hill is yep. battling some sort of injury, uh, and they don't know if he'll be healthy or not for for Saturday. But uh, if you can keep him healthy, great. If not, they've got corners who can uh, fill in for him. But yep, uh, you just got to be able to to win with four because I like Nick Evers. I know he was a very highly ranked recruit, uh, which it seems like that was four years ago when he was a highly ranked recruit. Um, yeah. That man's been in college for a while. Uh, he's not the same player. Uh, no. He's not developed enough to be a – and this is inevitably going to get clipped after he does some, something insane on Saturday. I already know it's going to happen. Um, but, like, he has not done enough in his college career for me to sit here and be worried about the dude who used to be a four-star recruit, right? Like, FAU's got dudes who used to be four-star recruits yep. on their team. Yep. Oh, it's, like, it's valid. At, at some point, it's like you just have not lived up to expectations. So – the, the bigger thing for me is you got to be able to stop the run, whatever they're throwing at you. If you can make them one dimensional and make Nick Evers beat you, you can beat UConn by two scores pretty easily. Yeah. They got talented backs, uh, Edwards and Robinson. That's a pretty, pretty dynamic duo. Uh, Edwards is going to be the lead back. Um, but yeah, no, if they can, some, they, they bottled up uh, FIU. For the most part, they shut down Michigan State except K. Ron Lynch Adams, who I just think that he's a really talented running back that had less to do with FAU, but that missed tackle. But nevertheless, I do think uh, I think FAU has shown they look better against typical run fronts. Only two uh, two games uh, compared to Army, which we're not going to talk about that game against the run. Uh, but I think they do stack up well in the run. Uh, you know, Chisholm, Tom Herman mentioned needed to improve in the run game. Did that a little bit this week. Um, still definitely, uh, some improvement, but on the interior, Devontae Davis, Bryce Langston had really good games. Um, and, and really in the run game, it, our DBs are very active. Uh, CJ Hurd is one of the most leading to, I, I think he's got he's 20. So back good, he is so oh my good. God. He is all over the place. Yeah. All over. He's on, he's in every play. It's, it's, it's insane. I yeah, know, and I asked uh, I asked uh, Jackson Ambush this week if he's ever seen or heard or played with anyone his age who's as mature, and he's like, no, uh, they just simply. I don't think they exist. No, <laughs> and he's easy to find on the field. Yeah, I mean the the hair is just like okay, I see him. He's yeah. he's there. Yeah, blonder, and, uh, looks like, uh, like a mane flowing through the wind as he runs. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I feel like I, we need to find this guy and I'll deal with like head and shoulders or something. They're, they're, yeah, they're, so. Yes, they need to find him many they're, NIL deals before the, uh, the offseason well, comes around. There, there has to be a shampoo or conditioner local mom and pop shop in Boca Raton that's willing to sponsor a dude with that kind of hair. I would like, imagine you have to have something special, though, for the blonde dreads, right? I don't think you could just use. Yeah, I don't think he uses just normal uh, conditioner. He's not using like um, Perk Plus or something like that. Uh, I, like I, I use all yeah. of those. Stuff. Like you can wash your body. <laughs> Your hair, your hand, your car, your house. Yeah, I don't think he's using yeah. that. <laughs> That's right. I use the I use the all in one, twenty in one. The head and shoulders. <laughs> twenty in one. <laughs> Cleaning your kitchen counters with that, and <laughs> take a shower with your hair. If if air, you make soap. Yeah. <laughs> If uh, that's what you can use, Dawn soap. If it's good enough for ducks, it's good enough for me. But right. uh, <laughs> we just, we just like touch on the glory of the uniforms we wore last weekend those were good i like them i'm God. interested to see where they go from that because honestly they're winless in the sands and so it's like i don't i don't, I don't, don't believe i don't believe in that stuff dude That's, i do it's, it's like it, three games it's like not it's, even it's, a, sand it's a, one of the best uniforms, uniforms in college dude. football like hands hands down. To show but, you where my mind's at, I but if I wear a pair of dress socks and they FAU loses twice in them, I throw them in the garbage. So that's that's where my mind's at with all these superstitions. I'm very uh, I'm very superstitious. I think it's the jerseys. I don't do sand jerseys anymore. Although they look good, so it's like I want them to win. They look great. They look great. There's nothing like them in all of all of the land. So and it's like I want I no, want them to pick up great. Like, we'll win a game in them. We're going. I need to wear them versus Wagner. It's Wagner, then that'll break your curse, and you'll be able. To oh yeah, you, yeah. You wear up against Wagner, beat him like five face mask three, and the blue with the white. It reminds yeah. me of, like the good old days. That's what we wore in the New Orleans Bowl when we beat Memphis in there, uh, 2007. There is an argument to be had that that's been their best uniform set over the last few years in terms of how it looked. Uh, yeah, the way no, it played it was, like it was really nice. The only thing I would have probably done different was the blue pom the blue palm tree on the white helmet looks like. And I know they're probably trying to match the. Yeah, you. It's like they're they're trying to match the jersey and the palm tree. I think it would be cooler with red. 
uh, just a different color, but Maybe they should have put the old FAU on the helmet or something. Yeah, or just like do the normal owl head logo or something like nothing, that. Nothing on the sides, just you know, just that would have looked cool. Just the stripe. I don't know. There's there's a million things you could do. Ugh. If so, FAU equipment's listening, we have all the ideas for you. We have all the ideas. Just come on the pod. We should get them on the pod. <laughs> I like the jerseys. Uh, you know what I really like is this year the creative team started doing like release videos and stuff like that for the jerseys, which I think is really cool. Gets the fan base involved and yeah, that yeah. Type of stuff goes viral. Uh, and then you know it's like the it's like the beach picks. It's recruits. It's people for the school. All that good stuff. So yeah, love awesome. that. I love all that stuff. I love. I know the fans. They, they like knowing what the team is wearing beforehand. So they, a lot of people like me. I like to, especially for basketball. Football, whatever, there's a billion people there, I'll wear whatever. But for basketball, I like to know what the team's wearing, there right? Is, there is something about that gym being filled with people wearing blue and the team wearing blue. Like, there's yeah. something about that. Or red or sand. Yeah, or it yeah. just looks so cool yeah, when they're able to organize to do, it. I want them to do pink really badly. Like, I think, you know, just do the pink. Let's own, let's own the pink. The only problem with the pink is I feel like that's a one-time jersey. Like you cut, you cut, you, you no, bust it out like, once. Wear the white ones with the. I know we're yeah, talking about, but um, I think we got those white ones, and they have like a trim of blue and pink and purple, or yeah. on, the, on yeah. the collar, and those are really, those are awesome. Um, the pink's on there. You know, no, you mentioned you mentioned no. basketball, Mike. You know, we, we haven't spent some time talking about hoops in, in quite a while. Uh, you know, we, we're going lengthy, so we might as well touch on it uh, real quick. Uh, they had their open practice uh, this week. Mike, did, did you go at all, or was, did they lock you no, up? I, I didn't go. Um, some of us have to work for a living. Um, <laughs> I was not at the basketball practice that day, but uh, I've been keeping up keeping up with the coaches. Um, got together the other night, so we had, you know, had a good time, dinner here. and uh, um, But, yeah, I think, um, I think we have a lot to look forward to. The schedule is awesome. Right, we got it. We got a really, we got a really good schedule. Um, we got some some drivable uh, away games, which are cool. Right, playing UCF. Looking, yeah. looking forward to the opportunity to um, to beat them. Do we have USF? We have USF at home. Home and away. That's gonna gonna be yeah, home and away. That's that's another drivable, and that that's a banger for sure. We owe them one. I'm liking the non-conference schedule, Mike. I mean, you look at it, the potential for P5 games is on par with what they had last year. Um, you know, maybe not in terms of RPI or whatever it's called in, in overall ranking, but they're getting the same amount. Whether they're on talent level the same, I don't know. If uh, if Michigan State's as good as Arizona was, yeah, then it's close. Uh, they play UCF this year. They play Oklahoma State. They potentially – could play Miami. Uh, they will play Michigan State. That's four games right there. Uh, and I believe there's a third game in that. Huge game. That's a huge game. The Michigan State game is huge. Anytime you play an in-state rival like Miami, USF, yeah. UCF, potentially all this year, that's out of control, right? So it's huge, especially with the way Jake is. Uh, you know, he he. The, I think recruiting is going to be huge, uh, huge for FAU uh, this year. I think they're going to be landing types of recruits that we haven't really seen. We saw them land uh, Demon Parker's uh, little brother, I believe, uh, Josiah Parker, a six-seven forward. Uh, I don't know how I don't. Brennan Loria was six-six, correct? Yeah. Six-seven, six-six. Yeah, he was, he was really long. He might. I, I know Brennan was one of our highest-rated recruits. Uh, I think uh, I think Josiah is going to be up there. I don't know. Uh, I heard that. Meet him. What a nice kid! Super excited to come here, man. He loved. He he seemed to really like the. Uh, he was at, he was at the army game. He was in town for the army game, so I got to and meet he's him. Committed. What a guy! That's how you know yeah. he's a true FAU fan. He's ride or die, or an FAU yeah. guy, not a fan. Like really <laughs> you know, he got the whole experience. So you know, even though he's related to one of the uh, one of the guys on staff, you know, he still got the the recruiting experience, and it was. And That's what you got to do. It. Big, we're, we're going in the right direction with basketball. Coach Jacobs is a heck of a coach. And um, I, I heard there was a couple hundred students in attendance for that open practice. Seems like the, the fans are. You know, I mean, that's incredible. If yeah. it's true. Um, you, you know, they, they never had that kind of. Uh, if there's if there's yeah, even fifty have, students uh, for practice before, that's for I'd have sure. to ask with I'd have to check with Christian, but he did say uh, did say there was a pretty good crowd. He said a hundred. Uh, uh, so maybe not hundreds. That was that was an exaggeration. Even hundred would be a good number, you know. Like I've been to even some fifty for a, an open practice where it's like, I mean, it's hardly even like a practice at this point. It's you still like very. Drivers, early. 
practice? <laughs> no, I think that's Talk awesome. About practice? Talk about practice. The, I don't I don't remember FAU last year or the year before. I'm not sure about the year before, but I don't remember last year if they did. I don't think they did an exhibition game uh, in front of the home fan base. Um, oh, they were closed. They played two. Um, oh, yeah, I know about the, the secret scrimmages they did last year, but St. Leo – uh, is on the is on the schedule. It's not a it's not a secret <laughs> scrimmage. Uh, so that one it'll be I think a very good opportunity for the uh, for the fan base to uh, to see to see a really good squad uh, at home before and then they go and then they got to go play Indiana State a couple days later. So it's a good tune up game that's for the fine, squad. That's fine. Indiana State's fine. Yeah, though. Indiana State's yeah. not what they, they were back, last year. They went, they went back to um, the depths of you know of being Indiana State basketball. Uh, yeah, like. <laughs> They're Larry Bird is no longer in the building. <laughs> ah, man, I don't know. I, I, I they, 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 they uh, did the opposite of what FAU did. They went the Kyle Church approach. They hired from within. They hired an assistant, Matthew Graves, who looks identical to Josh Shirts if you've ever seen either of them. But um, we'll see how it goes. Um, you know, he wasn't wasn't able to retain Avila, but was able to to keep some of the guys, I believe. Josh Shirts went to the. Best possible school for him, aside from from FAU, of course he's alum, right? Yeah, he is. You know uh, that in that, uh, in that crazy alum, I know, I know, you know, I know he was in the mix, but um, he looks like a Billiken. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I look like the St. Louis mascot. He yeah, looks like a Billiken. I don't. I gotta now. I gotta Google the Billiken, but I won't Google the Billiken now. We're not gonna... St. Louis, man. Yeah, you gotta. You gotta know your mascots too. You can't just know, you know, random football stats from running backs. But, Sorry, uh, they don't have the mascots on PFF. You know, right? No, I'm kidding. But it's uh, the Billikens' uh, yards after contact. Figure it out for us. You should look at, look at look, you guys. You guys watching this pod, if you've, if you've actually stuck, stuck around for 56 minutes, um, check out the Billiken. Google it. Google image the Billiken, the St. Louis Billiken. It's hilarious. It's 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 it's, it's, it's are awesome. You, are you guys looking right now, Kevin? It's like a small. I've, I've seen it. I've seen it. Yeah, it's like it's like you with horns. <laughs> 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 That's awesome. <laughs> I don't. I don't. It, Come on, Robbie, look it up. Oh, Same. I'm looking it up. I don't, I don't know. Yeah, it's not gonna work. But um, what do you? Yeah. That's you pretty. Scary. I tried to hold it up to the screen, and it's I not. Share my screen. You should. Let me see it. It looks like a baby. Yeah, yeah. No, look at the look at the look at the logo though. Look at the logo. St. Louis Billigan logo. You gotta look at the logo and then put it right next to Kevin. Rick is going to edit, edit this out. You <laughs> cannot edit this out. This is what the people want. You yeah. don't <laughs> Kevin Fielder. St. Louis know. mascot. Noted St. Louis Billiken. Grand Billiken. <laughs> is it like, I, 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 I don't know. I'm going to have to do some Billiken research. But... You can shirtless too, which is great. <laughs> We shall see about the Billikens, uh, Indiana State versus FAU from the uh, – I, I was going to call it the Ohio YMCA, but it is actually a really nice facility. Uh, the athletes in action uh, it's built that up. It's brand new, right? It's brand new. Uh, yeah. It may not be the biggest you know, the big house, but it, it's it's a brand new facility, uh, and so should be a nice place to uh, for FAU to uh, tip off their season. Uh, but, guys, closing it out on UConn, any final thoughts? Do we want to do predictions this time? We can do I'm predictions. Down. We can do predictions. No better Who way to start. All? I'll I'll start. I'll start. Let's do, let's, do three, let's do three things. Three predictions, right? Final score. Yeah. Number of touchdowns. Total or just for FAU? For FAU. Like, okay. right? And uh, what's the third thing? Player to watch for? I don't know. Like that's yeah, we have a player to watch for. But we need. I feel like things things are better in threes. So we gotta have. Who a scores third. the first touchdown? Boom. Okay. Cool. All right. That's fair. Good job. That's why. All I'm right. Here. All right. So let's see. Um, in terms of the score, I definitely think it's not gonna be. I don't think FAU gets to thirty eight in this game. I, UConn's defense has been questionable, uh, but I think this the pace of this game is is gonna go by pretty quick. Um, and and and, and so. I think this game goes to FAU 28-24. Um, no field goals. I usually pick a field goal in my uh, 
in my predictions, but not going to. So, um, and in terms of uh, total touchdowns, that's four. Uh, and first touchdown of the game, mm, wishful thinking, but a red zone pass to Zeke Moore. Oh, I like that. I like yeah. that. Um, I'm going to ride with the hot hand, and we'll start with Zubair Mobley scores the first touchdown. Uh, he's looked incredible recently, so we're going to keep riding that. Uh, I think FAU wins 31-20, to 20, which would make that four touchdowns, I think. Because four times seven is twenty-eight. Yes, I know math. Um, uh, and then total, so total touchdowns for first touchdowns to Barry Mobley, thirty-one twenty FAU. Birdman, what you got? We're gonna win. We're gonna win. We're gonna. I'm. I. I like twenty-eight points. Same like number. Eight points, four touchdowns. I think we're gonna hold them under. I think we're gonna keep them at like fourteen points. I really do. We shall see. UConn's offense has been underwhelmed. The touchdown is going to be a C.J. Hurd interception. Oh, pick six. I love it. Defensive touchdown to start would be awesome. That's going to be it. That's how we're going to start the game. We shall see. That would be one way to uh, to that's make our, things that's like – That's old logo, by the way. <laughs> well, that's actually pretty good. That's good, uh, right? You know, actually, one thing I want to see in this game, though, is find a way to – I, I mean, are, I'm assuming they're scripting plays at least for that first drive, and we haven't seen one be successful yet. I want to see one of those first drives at least minimum end in a field goal, like minimum. I don't, you know, it, will it matter in terms of the end of the game? On the first drive. That would be awesome. Or an interception. Yeah. Just so, just so pick six on the first drive. Pick six. Uh, on, uh, defense, I'm not worried about. It's, I just want to see that offense wake up early. You know, I don't want to have to to wait until the second quarter uh, to 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 see that the offense has a pulse. So, um, you know, that get that get that thing going early. Run that ball. Get some push. Get Cam out of the pocket. Get him comfortable. Um, and hopefully, the Owls find success. They're going to be facing a UConn team. Uh, like Graham said, they're going to be trying to get a big win here too. Um, so we'll see. It'll be it 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 could go either way. Um, you know, these these this non conference schedule has been. Something for FAU next week's a little bit of an easier one, but this is definitely uh, a bit of a an interesting game because UConn struggled, but they can turn it around at any time. So we look, look, the line the line moved a lot too. We, you know, a couple of weeks ago we were actually I think we were favored, uh, but we I think we were, they were giving us three points I think, and now um, or we were giving them three points, and now uh, they are giving us two and a half. So um, the money is on UConn. It's there. It's been moving there. So. Yeah, I mean they're. Uh, I mean maybe they changed that after Tom Herman was talking about injuries. I don't know, but um, because I didn't see that. When did they change? It's minus two and a half right now. I don't know. I just looked. I had no idea. I still thought FAU was favored, but the more you know. Um, yeah, the um and the matchup predictor on ESPN moved also. So interesting. Something moved the needle. I don't. I, I rarely see it move that much. To it moved a lot. It's fifty-four percent UConn. So it's still still a fairly close game. You know. So. We shall see what occurs 7 p.m. from the rent. And I don't know the full name. I just know that everyone calls it the rent in Hartford, Connecticut. Uh, go go check it out if you're up there. I know FAU's got a big Northeast presence. Uh, I've seen some Owls Nest people say they're going up there. That's uh, going on for sure. Yep. Bring Owl Nation uh, to Hartford and uh, maybe get a victory uh, while you're up there. So, folks, thank you so much for tuning in to Inside the Borough for our special guest, Graham Chamberlain, our co host, Kevin Fielder, and Mike Birdman. I'm Robbie Lestella and we'll see you next week. Go Owls.